I'm going to talk to you this evening about building the right mindset. You know, every action is rooted in the thought that produced it. There is a reason why the Father wants us to take every thought captive to obedience. Because if a thought is not captive, um, if it's not captive to obedience, then we become captured by it in a wholly unappealing way. Your thoughts are either going to make you or they're going to break you. They're going to advance you or they're going to retard your growth in the Spirit. Every action is rooted in the thought that produced it. Wrong thinking, therefore, makes a way for negative behavior. James 1, 5 to 8. Let me read that to you. Okay, hold on to your horses. I'm going to read the Bible. <laughs> James 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So that's a good thing, right? That means you should go, trial, yahoo, happy birthday to me. Woohoo, you should be calling your friend. I've got a trial today. And your friend's going to go, dude, I'm jealous. <laughs> Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And that endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The whole point of a trial is to give you something. Not to take anything away from you. It is to advance you. It is to add something to you. That's why you should be joyful. Because God allows in His wisdom what He could easily prevent by His power. So He adds a trial to you because it's His way of bringing you into a fresh place and a fresh anointing. So when we're partnering with God, we always have to partner through laughter. We partner with God in joy. That means we partner through laughter. We partner through smiling, through grinning, because there are no Eeyores in heaven. They've all been changed in the twinkling of an eye on the way up. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. There's only one way to think. There's only one thought to have in any situation. And that's the one that Jesus is having about it. Yeah? So when we are... Um, learning how to walk with God, we are submitting ourselves to the way that He thinks. We're submitting ourselves to the way that He perceives that situation to be from His own heart and His own affection and His own intentionality. And we're submitting to the way that God wants things done so that we can actually receive an upgrade. What if every single situation had an upgrade attached to it? I believe it does. In the generosity of God, every situation, good, bad, or ugly, has something tangible in it for us to receive and enjoy. Count it all joy. When various trials and situations occur, because the whole point is that you will be lacking in nothing in that situation. So your thinking has to release you to a point where you receive something no matter what the circumstances are. It's impossible for us to receive when our thinking is not renewed in that situation. So think of it this way. Every circumstance you have is an opportunity for you to think brilliantly about God, about yourself, about the situation that you're in. The mind of Christ is the most profound most dynamic 
most incredible, amazing way of thinking ever. And he sees things that you couldn't imagine by yourself. So the mind of Christ opens you up to see what heaven is doing. Right thinking will always generate faith. Here's the point. Your starting place always guarantees the outcome. Your starting place always guarantees the outcome. If you start from a bad place, the outcome is not going to be what you want it to be. But if you start from the place that God has actually assigned to that issue, to that situation, to that circumstance, He's assigned a starting place for you. The place where you can come and stand and connect. Yeah? And when you find that starting place, and you stand in it, and you embrace it, and you confess it to the Father, then your outcome is guaranteed from that place. So in every situation, it is, one thing is of paramount importance, and that is that you discover the starting place in that situation where God can connect with you and prepare you for the upgrade that's actually there, that you can see it. Sometimes we get so hung up with the situation, we can't see anything. We let it get so up front with us, so up close, we can't see anything. Every situation carries an upgrade with it. Your starting place guarantees the outcome. And the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit is to teach us the starting place in each situation we find. And that's part of the reason why we, we grow up into all things in Christ, because we're learning where is our point of connection in this situation with Him. And when you get a different situation, you're looking for that point of connection because you know that one exists. It's there because of who He is. And because of how he sees you, and because he has this joyful job of making each one of us Christ-like. So Jesus was never stumped by anything. He knew the point of connection with his Father. He would often say, I only do what the Father's doing. I only say what he's saying. So in every situation you face, your point of connection is the Father is saying something here and He wants to do something here and I need to find that starting place and the Holy Spirit is going to show me because my starting place guarantees the outcome in the circumstance that I'm facing. Therefore, every situation we're in has a real critical point of excitement. It's a Yahoo moment. If you go through a day without having a situation, you're going to get withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> Scripture says, of him are you in Christ Jesus. That's your starting place. Father, I'm in Christ. So everything that should come into this situation comes to the Jesus in me. Yeah? Heaven is attracted to Jesus. Why do you think God put you in Christ in the first place? Why do you think he put you in Christ and put Christ in you? Because all of the kingdom, all of heaven is attracted to the Jesus in you. That should make life extremely interesting. Yeah? I wonder, Lord, what is being attracted to Christ in me right now? We need to break the cycle of fear and anxiety and worry and doubt and unbelief because a double-minded man is unstable. I'm not sure what a double-minded woman is. <laughs> Maybe it's only the men who are double-minded. This may be the only time that men admit that, you know, men and women, it's, it's, it's genderless. <laughs> okay, it's going to take a while. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
Everything comes to the Jesus in you. Everything comes to your new nature. It doesn't matter what your struggles are. The Father is pretty clear in himself about how he sees you. He says that you are a new creation. Yeah? A a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Everything has become new and all things are of God. What does that mean? It means there were two creations in humanity. One was pre-cross and one was post-cross. Pre-cross in the Old Testament People could have the Holy Spirit come upon them, and they lived in a visitation culture. God came. There were seasons and times God came. He visited. He came upon people. He gave them special graces and powers and anointings to do certain tasks. That was one creation. Visitation culture, God could come upon them. But a post-resurrection culture changed all of that and a whole new people group emerged who don't have God living on them, they have God living in them. So now the New Testament is not a visitation culture at all, it's a habitation culture. Because the presence of God is with you. Jesus said the kingdom shall be in you. You carry the kingdom with you everywhere, and God is not coming upon you anymore. He's rising up from within because He's already taken up residence. So you are a new creation. You are a people group never seen in the earth before. That's what new creation means. So we live in a habitation culture, and what we are doing is we are maintaining the habitat. Yeah? It's called abiding. We're learning how to stay, how to dwell, how to remain in who Jesus is for us. And we're learning that in every situation I face, God is already in this situation with me because I carry him in the inner man of my spirit. And we're learning, therefore, that God is not touching us from outside. He's actually rising up from within because he's already taken up residence in us. I thought that was good news. (laughs) The good news is your old nature is dead. Yahoo. And we are learning how to be alive to God. God gives us permission. Consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to me. The enemy would like you to consider yourself alive to sin and potentially having difficulties with God. Yeah, he's such a liar. The Lord says, no, I want you to consider yourself dead to all those things that would disqualify you and alive to me because I'm the great qualifier. So we are learning to be focused on our real identity in Jesus. That means, therefore, we seek his perspective and his abilities in every situation. I want to know what Jesus is thinking. I want to know what he's praying because I want to pray the same thing. I want to think the same way. I want to see this issue the way he sees it. And I'm waiting until I get that revelation. I'm not doing anything. I want to know what my starting point is, because I, I want my outcome guaranteed from that place. Scripture says it's Christ in us, which is the expectation of glory. The confident expectation of of something glorious occurring in this situation. We don't want to be in Christ and still falling short of the glory of God. Every one of your situations has a potential to carry some glory within it. Yeah? Because Jesus is glorious, and if he's living in you, that's going to make you somewhat glorious yourself. So look at your neighbor and say, you're starting to shine. (laughs) Scripture says okay time out she's give you guys an inch (laughs) Scripture says in him we live and move and have our being that is situational it's circumstantial it's for every area of life 
In Him, we live, we move, we have our being. He's connected. He wants to make that connection stronger through the situation that He allows and often the situation He provokes. Our starting point is that we're a new creation in Christ. All the old has passed away. Everything's become new. Everything is of God. Whatever issue we face, here's the thing. Every issue you face that issue is already in Christ because He's in you. You can't have a life in Christ and then have an issue as a separate thing. That's weird thinking. Every issue in your life is in Christ because you are. That's the starting point. Okay, somebody breathe. It feels like a, there's a black hole there. I feel like I'm going to get sucked into a wormhole and end up in a parallel universe or something. If you're in Christ, so is your situation. Right? It's got, it makes sense, right? P- talk to me. Thank you. I think I'm up here talking Hindustani or something. Whatever issue we face is already in Christ. That is good news. That's good news. It means you can't fail. You're in Christ. So is the problem you're facing. It's in Jesus. That would be a Yahoo moment. So what that means is every issue you face is already assigned an outcome that God wants to generate. Yeah, now that's thinking brilliantly. Every issue you're facing has already been assigned an outcome that God wants to generate. So you're feeling pretty curious right now, huh? You're like going, cool, then I should just take all my problems for a spin and find out what all my upgrades are. Never let a circumstance rob you of your identity. Jesus is all and in all. Yeah? He is your divine advantage. Your starting place guarantees your outcome. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, God always leads us in triumph. That's a good starting place. Start with a win in your thinking. I am so going to win. Yeah? People accuse me of being triumphalistic. (laughs) Guilty as charged. I resemble that remark. Why would you want to live any other way? Why would you want to make allowances for being defeated? When you could make allowances for winning every time. So in your starting place then, in every situation is, there's a victory for me in this situation and I'm so going to find it. This situation is designed to draw me into a space with God where I win something. He always gives us the victory in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Therefore, we fight from victory, not towards it. Because victory is your starting place. Yeah? So you're not trying to get somewhere in this situation. What if you're already there and you just need to know what there, where there is? Yeah? You're already, there's a breakthrough been assigned to you. There's an outcome assigned already. There's a victory assigned to you. Brilliant thinking says, I'm just going to worship the Lord until I get a revelation of what that is. Then I'm going to move. Yeah? That's why rejoicing and thanksgiving is so critical. Because what are we rejoicing over? We're rejoicing that God is with us and He never leaves us. We're giving thanks because He has assigned an outcome to my issue, to my situation, to my problem. So I'm giving thanks already in advance because I can't live in Jesus and not be favored. It's against the law of life. In Christ Jesus. 
the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus says, you're in Him, you're subject to all that He is vulnerable to in heaven. And He's vulnerable to a lot on your behalf. He ever lives to make intercession for you. What's He doing? He's praying that you'll get it. He's praying that you'll see it. He's praying that you'll get it. He's praying that you'll own it. He's praying that every trial will advance you, that every trial will make you grow up, that every trial will make you happier, more, more stable, more sensitive to Him, more brilliant in life, as it is designed to do, because every trial has an outcome from heaven already assigned to it, and it is your pleasure to discover the will of God. That's thinking brilliantly. In Christ, we never start with a deficit. We begin with the outcome that He sees over us. I can do all things in Christ who empowers me. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things in Christ. I can do this. That's the attitude of the Holy Spirit. He can do everything. He's a genius. He's always saying, Graham, tell them I'm a genius because they live like they don't know. <laughs> He's the one who comes along and he says, I can do that. You want some help with that? I'm really good at that. I know exactly how to do that. You want me to talk to you about that? I'll talk to you about that. You want a bit of advice? I've got some great advice. I know exactly what to do in that situation. And to him, everything is doable. Everything is doable. I can do that. I'm really good at that. That's my specialty. And you discover that everything is his specialty. Because he's a genius and he doesn't mind letting you know. Yeah, I'm a genius. That's why I got this job. Because I'm a genius. I love problems. I eat problems. I love every issue because every issue is in Jesus and I know exactly what he's praying and I'm working in line with what he's praying. It's good news he's starting to look better, eh? Here's the thing. Because you're in Christ, it's the perfect starting place because it banishes all negative thinking, all low self-esteem, all weariness, and all passivity. So problems refresh you. Problems have a way of just blessing the socks off you. So what if refreshing is attached to every problem? Wouldn't that be just like God? To take everything that the enemy wants to make you weary. So everything God does, he wants to do the opposite of what the enemy is doing. The enemy wants to make you tired, weary, fearful, anxious. God wants to make you rested, refreshed, joyful, and full of trust. And Yahoo, I love this life. So our focus on the beginning of something is really about being refreshed. Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers. He's so generous, he's not content to give you one river. He wants to give you several. So what that means is when you've got rivers flowing out of you, you're either going to spend a long time in the bathroom <laughs> or you're just going to learn to be extremely happy all the time and refreshed. What if every problem is designed to refresh you and not make you weary and not make you tired and not make you anxious, but do the exact polar opposite. That would be good news. That would be the gospel. That would be heaven coming to earth. Because there's no weariness in heaven. And you're connected. What if we're learning how to live a life above tiredness, above weariness? What if we're not designed to be empty, we're only designed to be full? Your starting place guarantees your outcome. 
So our focus at the beginning is on being empowered in our thinking so that our emotions can become energized. Otherwise, our emotions are going to feed off all that negativity. And then we get into a place where oh, I, can't, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing that. And our mind has talked us out of something. Our emotions and our thinking are conspiring against our spirit when they should be submitting to it. You know when your emotions are running the show because your thinking is weak. A negative mindset establishes your inability. I can't do it. I'm no good. It's too big. We're not strong enough. We're not big enough. We're not powerful enough. We feel like grasshoppers in our own sight. I always say things like, oh, well, you know, it's not really me. I'm too scatty. I can't do that. That's not my strong point. Really, I'm totally disorganized. And what we're doing all the time is we're confessing to something that we're not rather than confessing to who we really are. Jesus is in you. You stop being scatty when he came in. You stop being disorganized. You stop being this thing that you attribute to your old nature because that's dead. You've got a new nature. You need to start confessing in line with it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, who empowers me, who enables me. There isn't anything I can't learn and there isn't anything I can't do with the help of the Holy Spirit and six friends. Don't reinforce the negative. There is a difference between that which is true and that which is the truth. In Christ, there's always a higher level of truth than the facts. Some things may be true, but the truth sets us free. You know, speaking the truth in love is not about telling people all their shortcomings in the nicest possible way. That's not speaking, and I'm saying this in love, brother. No, you're not, you lying little toad. <laughs> speaking the truth in love is not telling someone's shortcomings as nicely as possible, because that's not the truth. That's only true. But the truth is, they're dead in Christ, and all that stuff is done away. The truth is, this is who you are in Jesus. So when we're speaking the truth in love, we're not putting someone down nicely. We're elevating someone brilliantly. We're saying to people, you don't need to be doing that because this is who you are and you speak the truth in love and you, you empower them. You make them want to become that person. Dude, this is who you are. You're brilliant. You're this. You're this. You're this. This is who Jesus is for you. That's who Jesus is for you. You can do this because he's with you. And you're speaking the truth in love because the truth is a person and his name is Jesus. So you're speaking Jesus to people when you speak the truth in love. This is who Jesus is for you. This is why you're going to have an amazing, astonishing life. This is why God is going to lift you out of the ordinary into the extraordinary. Because no one can be ordinary in Jesus. It's not allowed. He's in you. One of his names is wonderful. So what does that make you? It makes you at least potentially astonishing. The starting place is the love that God has for us and our conviction about his purpose for us in the situation that we're in. The truth is, every issue is already assigned an outcome that God has designed for you. The truth is, he makes all things work together for good. The mind of Christ allows us to turn a weakness 
into a joyful vulnerability to his goodness. You are so vulnerable to the beauty of Jesus. Come on, if he showed up right now, you'd all be gaga. You'd all be like Homer Simpson looking at chicken. You'd be drooling. You'd be drooling. You'd be looking at him. You'd be lost in who he is. Because he's irresistible. And you're designed to go gaga. So guys, when you go to bed with your wife tonight, you're sleeping with Lady Gaga. <laughs> I'm not sure if that is a good thought or what. I don't know if that will make it onto the lexicon of brilliant thoughts, but... Anything to put a smile on your face. It's our privilege to take a negative thought captive to a better one. Think again is the essence of all repentance. If all your thinking has brought you to a place you don't like, have another thought. It could just be the making of you. Guy, that, there's a better thought out there. Why don't you go for the better thought? Stop wallowing around. You know where that thought's going to take you. So could you please change it? Like your, message, your angel is trying to flashing up messages on your computer. Could you ch change that thought, please? You've had it for the last nine months. You know it's killing you. Stop it. <laughs> Every day we wake up with the mindset that works for us or against us. A negative mindset kills our creativity and it robs us of power. Romans 8, 6 says, A mindset on the spirit, life and peace. It produces a way forward and it allows us to enjoy the circumstances and the discovery that we're going to make. It allows a strength to emerge and be developed. God always provides us with a way through. That's why there's no frustration in heaven. Can you imagine heaven being frustrated? All the angels scratching their head around the throne going, well, I don't know, I'm stumped. I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm so frustrated right now. <laughs> Imagine the Father saying to Jesus, yeah, I'm so, so frustrated. <laughs> no. There is no frustration in heaven. There has never been any frustration in heaven. Frustration is a construct from the world around us. We're in Christ. Our starting place guarantees our outcome. So what if all frustration has a heavenly counterpart? What if frustration is actually a sign that an upgrade is present? What if frustration is God stopping you walking down a road that he doesn't want you walking down? So you come up against this block, so then you have to turn yourself around and walk in a different direction. What if frustration is a ding? You're now safe to move around the kingdom. Yeah? What, if it's, what if it's a moment? What if it's a sign that the Lord is saying, no, that's not going to work. This will work, though. What if it's a sign that an upgrade is present and you need to stop worrying enough to look around and find it? If you're frustrated by anything, God is trying to get a message to you. Excuse me, is anybody at home? I see the lights are on, but... <laughs> Hello? Upgrade here. <laughs> Frustration is a confession that we're powerless, that we're obstructed, that we're stymied, that we're invalidated. 
That's not throne room thinking. Throne room thinking always declares our place of advancement. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Throne room thinking declares who I am in Jesus. Now we need to do some work on this. And, but here's the, here's the thing. If you're going to work on this, could you do it happily? <laughs> could you do it joyfully? Like, this is going to be so cool. The Holy Spirit is challenging you to rethink your assumptions. Rethink your starting place. The power of the heavenly minded is that our hearts and our minds are always in sync with who God is for us. Yeah? Whatever is bound in heaven can be bound on earth. Yahoo. Whatever is loosed in heaven can be loosed on earth. Sometimes frustration is the Lord saying, you should be binding something round about now. <laughs> yeah? And if you're going to bind that thing that's stopping you from moving forward, then you need to also loose something that can actually propel you forward. Here's the thing. At least can we have the decency to be intrigued? <laughs> I wonder what you're up to. You're always up to something. There's only one way to live in the glad tidings of great joy. And that's happily. It's joyfully. It's intentionally. It's with a sense of intrigue. I know the Father loves me. I wonder what this situation is for. What are you doing? The two best questions, you've heard me say it so many times, found on the day of Pentecost. What does this mean and what must I do? Those are the two greatest questions because they've got upgrades all over them. What does this mean? I don't want to miss anything that you're doing. What are you doing? I know what the enemy is doing. I know what that person's doing. I know what this situation wants to do. But what are you doing? What does this mean for you? What does this mean for our relationship is a great question. What does this mean, Lord? And what, what do I, what's my part in this? How do you want me to position myself? What do you want me to think? How do I partner with you in this situation? Where's my starting place? What's my outcome? All ah, right, I get it. I see it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, I want to go there. Every situation carries an upgrade. What if the kingdom equivalent of frustration is endorsement? That God wants to endorse something about you in Jesus. Here we are saying, I can't do this. It's not working. I'm so frustrated. And the Father's saying, no, let's change that thinking. Is In this situation right now, I am endorsing something for you in the Spirit. I'm setting you up for something. I want you to know something about yourself. I want you to know something about who I am for you in this situation. Endorsement is our place of advancement. What if there's a promotion in that situation in the Spirit? What if there's a promotion just in life? How many of us right now are in difficult jobs thinking about leaving? What if the Lord doesn't want you to leave? What if He wants to promote you? You might be interested in asking anyway. What if he wants to authorize something? In fact, what is the Lord authorizing in your life right now? What's he saying yes to? What's he giving you permission for? If everything is yes and amen in Christ, what is he authorizing? What has he sanctioned? What's the outcome? What has been assigned to your current situation? What if God wants to upgrade your favor? What if he wants to affirm to you the next level of your identity? What if he wants to stimulate your faith so you can believe him for something that he's always wanted to give you? What if he's trying to create some fresh expectation in your heart? 
Here's the thing about frustration. To really get the best out of it, frustration has to turn to celebration. If you stop being frustrated and started celebrating, you'd be in a whole different space. And so would your circumstances. You can make your circumstances bow the knee to the Christ in you. It starts with a thought. What does this mean for you and I, Papa? How do I stand with you in this? Here's the, here's the thing. It's not enough for us to believe. We must become fully persuaded. That's the journey that we're on. You know, faith is not difficult to acquire. Faith works by love. So I'm always saying to people, when people say to me, oh, I don't really, I don't really got the faith for that. Well, don't concentrate on faith. Concentrate on being loved. If you're loved, faith will come because you know you're loved. Faith gives you a power. That love gives you a power that results in faith. Faith is a consequence of being loved. Faith works by love. When you know that you are the beloved of God, when you know that He adores you, faith is not difficult to acquire. Trust is easy because you're trusting in the greatness of somebody who's a million times bigger than you. And isn't it great to walk with that person in my circumstances? Faith works by love. But we're learning how to be fully persuaded. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.12. He said, I am absolutely convinced that God is able to keep that which I've committed to him. A mindset in Christ always chooses a brilliant starting point that guarantees an amazing outcome. In 2 Kings chapter 6, it's the story of two guys in the same situation, Elisha and his servant. One guy um, had a different starting point to the other. The other guy's starting point was fear, worry, anxiety. Alas, my master, it's, it's over. There's an army around the town. They're all looking for you. They're going to kill me as well in case the anointing might have rubbed off. I'm dead. Alas, it's over. It's finished. And he can't understand why Elisha is smiling. Elisha's looking out there going, this is cool. Whoa. Hey, dude, there's more with us than there are with them. Yeah, and the servant's going, note to self, don't give him yogurt last thing at night. No pizza for breakfast. Lay off the dairy produce. What do you mean there's more with us than with them? He had a different starting point for that situation. And he knew, he knew this was it. This was the moment they'd waited for. This was the moment where for that whole entire generation of people, the Arameans would stop bothering them from this moment on. He saw it for what it was. This is my victory. This is the thing we've wanted to see for ages, and here it is right now. All the other guy can see is a crisis. All Elisha can see is, this is it. This is our victory. This is going to be so cool. And so he goes walking out to these guys, and they've all got laminated photographs of him. And they're all like looking at him, and this looks like the dude, but it can't be because he's right there, unless he's an idiot. And so they're all putting the photograph in the back pocket of their Levi's and looking at him, and, and he said, so can I help you? Well, we're looking for Elisha. Elisha, I know where he is. Walk this way. And he takes them on a 14-mile hike to where the king of Israel is waiting, and he's jumping up and down going, ooh, ooh, can we kill him? Can we kill him? And Elisha says, nah, let's just feed them and send them home, eh? They're done. I stuck a fork in. They're done. They're toast. And then it said, and those Arameans never returned. Outcome. Two guys, same situation, but their starting place was completely different. You have the authority and the power and the favor to choose the right starting place for your thinking in the situation you're in. And it is your joy, it is your pleasure to choose the right place, to be curious. be intrigued 
I wonder what you're going to do, Papa. Caleb went with a bunch of guys. And these 12 guys, they were like the best of the best. There was like the military version of American Idol. <laughs> In every tribe, they had like military idol. And every tribe went and they had these competitions to find out who is the nastiest, most courageous warrior we've got on our books. And they all put up, they had, yeah, our dude rocks. So then they're all paraded, all 12 of them, all big guys, uh, you know, they're all up for it. and They're sent out. Ten of them came back completely unmanned. These are tough men. They saw giants out there. They became fearful. They felt like grasshoppers. They were completely unmanned. Why? Because their starting point was not the same as Joshua and Caleb. Caleb came back really excited. It's like, dude, there are giants out there and they're flipping huge. This is going to be so much fun. They're going to be our prey. Can you imagine it? That's a starting place. Guaranteed the outcome for him. There are giants out there. It's going to be so cool. Because if God is pleased with us, and he is, then they will become our prey. God is with us. He couldn't wait to get started. Forty years later, you know, in the battle, there's one last stronghold, which is actually Hebron. One last stronghold. And they've had victory after victory. And he elbows his way to the front. And he gets in Joshua's face. And he says, listen, Josh, dude, you were there when Moses promised me my inheritance. That's it. All the giants are congregated. They've got nowhere to go. They're going to be vicious. It's going to be great. But I want that stronghold as my inheritance. Why? Because his starting point was majesty. It was sovereignty. He couldn't wait to go up against those guys. He's like, push off, get your own inheritance. That's mine. That's mine. I want this one. I'm 80 odd years old and I'm still strong and I'm powerful and I can do it because I'm a kick butt kind of guy in the kingdom. And I want this last. There might not be a fight for years. So I want this last one. Y'all go off on vacation. I can deal with this. Yeah? His starting point was majesty and sovereignty. He couldn't see any other, anything other than a victory. God is with me. Your starting point always guarantees your outcome. David, when he came up against Goliath, if you check it out in 1 Samuel 17, he makes six amazing statements. Four of them he makes to Israel, and two of them he makes to Goliath himself. He knew the battle was the Lord's. He knew the outcome before he even set out there. He knew the outcome. He knew that he wasn't going to die because he had a prophecy from Sam that he was going to be king. He's not king yet. So he can't die. So Goliath, this is your unlucky day. <laughs> and God looked at his heart and says, he's a man after my own heart. Why? Because his starting place with God was God's starting place with him. He's a man after my own heart. He can read my heart in every situation he's in. That's what it means. He can read my heart. He can read my affection in every situation he faces. He can see me in it, waving. <laughs> he can read my heart in every problem. He has a good starting place. David said, I would have despaired unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He chose, he did not choose the negative. He chose the opposite. I'm going to believe there is the goodness of the Lord in this situation and I'm going to see it. 
I choose to believe in the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. When we work from victory, we can partner with God for the outcome. And the outcome is always more glorious than you imagine. The outcome for God is not just your situation being resolved. It's you growing in Christ. It's you taking on some substance. It's you taking on some majesty and some glory and some faith. It's you being advantaged. It's you receiving more favor. It's you growing in favor with God and man. In Christ, we are always more subject to refreshing than dryness. See, that, that's a brilliant thought right there. <laughs> you are subject to refreshing. Why? Because there are rivers of living water inside you. You're vulnerable to the power of God. You're not vulnerable to the enemy at all. Unless you want to be. A renewed mind is focused on majesty. Our starting place guarantees the outcome. We're in Christ. Therefore, so is every issue we face. Every issue is assigned an outcome that God wants to generate for you. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is before you go to bed this evening, ask the Lord some questions. What outcome has been assigned to me in the situations that I'm facing? Your glory, your strength, your power is finding that outcome. What's the outcome? And you can trace it back to the starting place. So, you mean I should have been standing here all along? Uh-huh. Okay, then. And we are going to find the grace to be excited. To count everything as a joyful thing. Why? Because this situation can't be here except that I get upgraded through it. So, I want my upgrade. You know, there are unclaimed upgrades all over this room. It's because we're not finding our starting place in the situations that we're facing. Every situation you're in right now is in Christ with you. What has he assigned to you? What's he assigned? What is he doing? Let's be curious. Let's be intrigued. Let's ask the Lord. Let's be joyful. Let's be happy when a problem comes because it's sent to advantage us in some way. Let's choose our starting place. Choose the place where you're going to stand. It's the place that gives you you know, visual advantage. You start to see things that God is seeing. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, this is the beginning of days for us. This is turnaround time. Thank you that we are entering days of unending brilliance. Thank you that we're rediscovering Christ within the expectation of glory. Thank you that we are exploring every situation for signs of your presence, and they are there. Thank you that you always give us a future and a hope. Thank you that you are increasing our joy because you're always joyful. You're the happiest person I know. You have the sunniest disposition of anybody I've ever met. Thank you that you work everything together for good. Thank you that we can count it all joy because you're up to something in our life. And thank you for giving us the resident genius of heaven, the Holy Spirit, who is sent to disclose to us what is to come. He tells us the outcome. He tells us where to stand. 
He helps us in our thinking because he is amazing. And he's our helper. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So in Jesus' name, I proclaim over this house and all who come inside these walls, I proclaim that everybody who comes into this house will have their mind renewed in the Spirit. They will begin to think differently just by being here. That hope will rise up in our hearts. Joy will explode out of our spirit man. That we will begin to see the hand of the Lord. That hope will take hold of us. That we'll come under the divine advantage, the favor of the Lord Jesus. But our thinking will be massively renewed in Jesus' name. And I proclaim to you that this weekend is the beginning of times. There is a time of times coming into your life, and this weekend is the beginning of a whole new regeneration in your personality, in your way of thinking, in your way of seeing, that the Lord is saying, I am taking you from the basement to the penthouse. I want you to have a room with a view. I want you to have a room with a view in the kingdom. I want you to see all that's on my heart for you. I want you to know everything that results out of my affection for you. I want you to know that I have assigned blessing and favor and promise and provision to every situation that you are encountering. And I'm going to teach you how to think it, see it, move towards it, take hold of it, use it, become it, establish it, embrace it, and then give it away. So Father, in Jesus' name, We just give you thanks because this is our upgrade and we're taking hold of it. We are taking hold of it. We're taking hold of it. We're taking hold of it. I want this way of thinking. I want it. 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 I want this way of thinking. I want it. With everything in me, I want to think like Jesus thinks. I want to see the glory everywhere. I want to see the goodness of God. I want to be bathed in it. I want to be immersed in it. I want to drown in it and come back to life in it. I want it. I want to embrace it as a way of life. That from this moment on, I can't think any other way except the way that you think. So may it be so, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh.